Peter, oh, how does this work? With the pointer, this one? Uh, Mabel's not my Aunt Mabel at the, uh, at the Thanksgiving dinner telling you old hoary tales about family history. My Mabel is the marine atmosphere boundary layer, which is the principal source of sound in the ocean. And I'm particularly interested in the sound that comes from natural processes related to the wind overhead and not at all interested in the sound that's created by ships and other surface sources. This shows spectrogram spectrums of the deep pressure at three sites in the subtropical uh, Pacific Ocean. My earlier work with Walter has been at the station H20 run by Fred Denenbeer uh, on an abandoned undersea cable halfway between uh, Hawaii and San Francisco. But that's limited because the uh, recording bandwidth is only 40 or 50 hertz. So most of my interest is in the OBSAMP data that Peter Wooster and Ralph Stevens collected in 2013 in a, uh, in a basin in the Pacific Ocean, somewhat a little bit north of the, of the Murray Fracture Zone. And what you see there are spectrums for a sensor at the bottom, 5,000 and some meters beneath the surface, and the top of the array at one kilometer above the bottom. And, and you observe that for frequencies less than about 10 hertz, uh, the spectra, or 6 hertz, the spectra are very comparable. And, but above that, uh, we find that the noise or the floor, the signals are much elevated. And so I'm going to look almost entirely at the measurements on the bottom. Now, the OBSAMP instrumentation had a few difficulties in the band around here. So in order to get a complete spectrum, I paste in some of the measurements from the ACO array or the ACO sensor, which was deployed, is, is still operating about 100 kilometers north of Hawahu by the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics, Fred Dunnenbeer, uh, Bruce Howe, and others. Now, below one hertz, it's a, a well-studied band. That's where the microseisms are. Uh, uh, above one hertz, I believe that the bottom interaction is a much less significant influence on the propagation of the energy, and th thus it's the ocean we're looking at, the ocean surface in particular, rather than the bottom. So this is the spectrum that I've pasted together. You can see here where the OBSAMP data uh, have been truncated. That's the thick line and the true spectrum, if we had a lower noise system, would probably be like this. Uh, I'm measuring in uh, SI units. Uh, for those of you who prefer to use Navy units, this level here is 30 dB in micropascals squared per hertz. That's quite a low level. This purple line here, we're calling the acoustic floor, I'm not going to say much about. Uh, that's almost certainly due to distance shipping, and it has a very distinctive uh, F to the minus 2 fall with frequency. <laughs> Now the shipping noise peaks around here. Uh, this is a measurement or a spectrum for rather strong wind speeds, 10 to 15, 10 to 12 meters per second. This is an average wind speed, say six meters per second. And the blue line is for very, very low wind speeds, two meters per second or less. My interest is primarily in the overhead wind conditions of six plus or minus four meters per second because this embraces more than 75 percent of the wind conditions over the world ocean. Observe here uh, that the, uh, the, the signal from the wind sea overhead uh, uh, the, the strongest winds, the red line, is, is rather inconsistent. Uh, a, a mere one or two meters per second change in, in wind speed makes quite a difference in the spectrum level. This is the largest of all, but it's the smallest there. That's quite different at the lower frequencies here, where uh, the blue line, which are the lowest recorded levels, are very comparable on the, on the three measurement sets. <coughs> 
And another thing to note is that the moderate winds, an average wind of six meters per second, is pretty much uh, superimposed on the very strong levels, 14, 10 to 14 meters per second. And that reflects, we believe, the fact that the wind sea spectrum uh, saturates at, uh, at, large, at large wind speeds, and a change in the wind does not make a change in the spectral level. Now, I've shown here on the dashed black line a very simple model of the pressure that would be radiated, the pressure that would be radiated from a sea surface uh, which was driven by the Longett Higgins effect, which I will go into more detail later. This is the radiation caused by opposing waves of nearly the same frequency colliding and sending a sound wave downwards. Uh, the theory was developed to explain microseisms on land and sea. Those are, the wave, those are the Rayleigh waves in the sea bottom, which are strongly coupled to the acoustic field overhead because of a frequency wave number matching. As I say, I'm eliminating that. I'm looking at a purely acoustic problem, one hertz and higher. So the Longett Higgins mechanism requires a spread of directions of the wave field. Now this cartoon uh, shows a wind generating a sea moving rightwards and a wind generating a sea moving leftwards, uh, creating a case where if the opposing wave fields have nearly the same frequency, they collide and emit an acoustic wave going downwards. That's a rare situation, but I think it's happened at least, well, one good example of where I think it's happened is at Hurricane Alma in May of 2002, uh, a study reported by Abreski and all more recently. In this case, Alma was a tropical storm off Baja, California, generating a swell moving northwards. And at nearly the same time, there was a storm in the Gulf of Alaska moving south and east, radiating a swell southwards. And they did collide over the H2 observatory and made a large microseism signal. That's not the colliding wave field that we're working on. We're working on colliding wave fields caused by a unidirectional wind, which it turns out generates waves going at angles to the wind direction. Uh, this is a natural outgrowth, or it commonly occurs in the modeling of a wind sea by the weather centers. I'm working more closely with ECMWF. If you blow a wind in this direction, at low frequencies, the waves go with the wind, but at higher frequencies, the waves go away from the wind. Uh, that comes out of the modeling. It's been observed for years. For example, this is on the right, some recent measurements of looking at Ken Melville, uh, which shows a peak in the spectrum. This is determined by the wind speed overhead. And these two lobes going off left and going out right. And when you're a two orders of magnitude higher than the peak, the lobes are some 60 or so degrees separated on either side of the wind direction. Uh, the data that Wall and I worked with is shown here, uh, where the X's show how the separation of the two lobes goes, increases as you get further away from the peak in the spectrum. Now, these units are actual radians per meter. These units are in ratios of the frequency to the peak frequency, F over FP. Both of these cases are for a 10 meter per second wind. And so the question occurs, what about lower speed winds? Well, what we do is we use the fact that the scaling F over FP can be turned sideways, and instead we fix F and hypothesize that as the waves, as the wind speed changes, FP changes, and so we essentially can put a speed label along the axis of this wine, of this wine glass, showing two, three, and four meter per second winds, giving a larger separation in the lobes. We hypothesize that the lobes of the, of the uh, wave field uh, consists of Gaussian beams. This is a case where you have a very low wind speed. The beams are about 15 degrees separated, and they're so uh, 
close together that you can barely resolve the peaks. As the wind becomes, uh, goes more strongly, the lobes separate and eventually you can distinguish the two peaks, two, the, two, uh, the two peaks separately. Now how do we go from the red curve to the blue curve in the spectrum from the Long and Higgins mechanism? Well, again, we rely on ocean wave physics, which says to a first approximation, the amplitude spectrum of the sea doesn't change as the wind blows stronger. Instead, what happens is the peak of the spectrum simply moves down, but you have saturation in the, at the higher frequencies. Well, if we assume there is a really a saturated wave spectrum, then the only other way to get a change in the pressure is by the second term that affects the radiation, which is the overlap integral. The overlap integral is the integral over the full 2 pi of the spread function times the spread function, uh, 180 degrees separated. Clearly, this result would give a very, a relatively small uh, result for the overlap integral than the case where there are these two separated peaks. So we have these Gaussian beams with a, with a variable separation and a variable width. And we can plot the overlap integral on a 2D plot where this parameter is how far the beams are separated. This parameter is how wide the beams are. The widest beam, of course, you can get is an isotropic result. The narrowest beams are the pencil beam either in the direction of the wind or opposed or opposite, opposite to each other. And you can find a path through this beam uh, beam width, beam separation space, which more or less, more or less mimics the 20, degree, 10, 20 dB decrease in the, in the power spectrum on account of the wind changing overhead. Next, I'd like to turn to a second example of the relationship between ocean weather and bottom acoustics. And this wouldn't have been possible without the brilliant seamanship of Peter Wooster and Ralph Stevens, who put out the Obsamp array at exactly the right place and exactly the right time in order to pick up two beautiful examples of canonical weather systems over the ocean. For two or three days in the early part of the deployment, there was essentially an anticyclone centered over the deployment location. It sat there for two or three days, and we've used those measurements to pick up what we've called the acoustic floor. Those are the blue lines you saw in the previous spectra, the spectrum that occurs when the wind overhead is essentially vanishingly small. I think even more interesting was the event that occurred nine or 10 days later on this, on this remarkable deployment. The cold front moved from the northwest to the southeast, passing over the OBS amp location. And this white box is, is, the, is centered at the, the same location, but the box shows the spread of distances over which sensors were deployed on the bottom with the vertical array about here. As the cold front passed over the array, we got some remarkable uh, uh, six bottom acoustic signatures of the passage. Uh, first, uh, let me ca call attention to the jump in the wind speed at Melville. It occurred on the time scale of a few minutes, 10, 10 to 15 minutes. The wind went from two to approximately seven meters per second. Now, the red line shows the measured wind. The black dash is a approximation of a sigmoid function which tries to have a steady level here, a steady level there, a midpoint at some time where it's halfway between the levels, and a gradient at that midpoint which tells you how fast the wind was changing as the front passed overhead. This curve shows the velocity on a seismometer at an OBS on the bottom. Again, I have fit the sigmoid function attached uh, to the red data, and you can see the change in the pressure was perceptibly slower than the change in the wind. And their most remarkable comparison are the 4 hertz pressure and the 400 hertz pressure. The times at which the 
change in pressure was uh, halfway between the extremes were nearly the same, and the but the rate of change as it reached the as it passed the midpoint was on order of an hour as opposed to the order of minutes here. Well, one way we can watch, we can track the motion of the cold front is by using the old seismic exploration technique of move out analysis. When does the event occur at your station's location? And this shows the, uh, the move out. These are the station locations projected on the direction of travel of the cold front and two possible speeds through the, through the data. Uh, this is at 4 hertz and this is at 400 hertz. Those data can be explained by a very simple model. We assume that the cold front consists of a half plane of acoustic dipoles moving at some speed in the some direction across over the array. I model the acoustic dipoles as being on the top of a bottomless ocean with a constant sound speed profile. We need to improve that, but this is, this is what we did at the time. On the left, you see the, uh, the, uh, uh, the model, the theoretical uh, change, the, the blue is the theoretical change in pressure for the half plane model, and the dash is again a tans fit, a sigmoid function identifying the halfway point of passage and the slope at the passage point. And if we use this to try and replicate the data, which we very simple to do, the rate of change of the acoustic is simply the variance is the slope in the data divided by the slope in the theory, we get we find that the change in pressure is too fast and the uh, inferred when the inverted speed of the front is much lower than is measured. However, if the half plane is preceded by a wedge, which is some uh, 12 or 15 kilometers wide, over which the wind speed, or rather the dipole strength, increases linearly, then we get a slower rate of change, and we get a more reasonable uh, uh, estimate of the, of the speed of passage of the front compared to the, either the measurement from the uh, from the wave model or from the, from the speed of the move out shown previously. Well, to summarize, what we know most about, I think, or most confident about, is a relationship between sea state and sound in the band of 1 to 10 hertz. We'd like to go to 10 to 20 hertz because 26 hertz is the 2F of the phase velocity minimum in the, in the, in the dispersion relation, which is of great interest. Uh, unfortunately, the, the ship interference is going to make that impossible. These are just some comparisons of the phase velocities of the, of the sea compared to the sound, uh, the wavelengths on the sea surface, six meters, for a 0.5 frequency wind sea, which of course maps to a one hertz 2F long at Higgins frequency. Um, compared to the wavelengths of the, of the acoustic field. This is, in fact, the sixth organ pipe mode of the wave field. Uh, I wish I could come back and see you in 20 or 30 years and make a similar table comparing the high-frequency acoustics to whatever it is on the ocean surface that's making them. Is it splashing from waves? Is it bubbles? Is it bubble clouds? Is it turbulence in the air? Is it solitons? They've all been proposed. It doesn't look very promising we'll be able to do this. Back in the good old days, back in the good old days, this was a very popular subject. Uh, they had international conferences. They wrote books on it. Uh, in Cambridge, they managed to get 70 participants. Four years later, at the Lake, Har Lake Arrowhead meeting, uh, they managed to drown to uh, come up with, uh, with some, some, some 40, 41 participants. Well, that, as, I, as you see, that's a compounded rate of change of 13% per year. Uh, we're 23 years on, so there are three of us left. I'm one, my colleague John Berger. Uh, anyone here? Well, uh, uh, another seven more years and there'll be one, and it's not going to be me. Uh, I have to acknowledge the et al's I showed on my, on my, on my cover slide. Uh, John Berger, uh, Jean-Richard Bilot, principally. Uh, others I've worked with in the past. 
It was Walter, of course, that got me started. I was, he came to Scripps in 1964, uh, the year that IGPP was dedicated. I came with a fresh master's degree from University of Newcastle, where I'd done paleomagnetism with Keith Runcorn, which is sort of an interesting background, because that wasn't a subject being researched here. And I had an office in Ritter Hall. Back in those days in England, you still had to wear a gown. You didn't wear it to class, but to go to dining hall, you had to put an academic gown on. So I was, I was feeling a bit formal, I guess. And Walter invited me up from Ritter Hall. IGPP was new. Uh, they had some empty offices. We had a good conversation. He invited me to join the institute as a new graduate student. Uh, as we were leaving, as I left, I said, thank you, Professor Monk. He said to me, you're very welcome, Mr. Farrell. It's been Bill and Walter ever since. <laughs> thank you, Walter, for 50 years of familiarity and some pretty good science along the way. Thank you. Questions before the break? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Well, we have a break until uh, 